Hola, ¿qué tal, colegas? Muy buenos eh, días, ¿cómo están? Mi nombre es Elizabeth Martínez. Bienvenidos a otra cápsula más de Neuroprácticas de Fabricación. En esta ocasión para hablar del tema de contaminación microbiológica en áreas limpias. En esta ocasión tenemos a un invitado muy especial del Reino Unido, Tim Sandel. Eh, Tim, eh, nice to meet you eh, and thank you very much for your time. It is really a great honor to have you here. You know that I have a, a GMP section for interviewing about uh, important topics. In this case, we will talk about microbiological contamination in syndromes. Uh, welcome and thank you again for your time. Okay, thank you very much. So the first question, Tim, what are the main sources of microbiological contamination in clean rooms? Um, that, that's a good question. And th there are um, a number of um, different sources. Um, so we have the transfer of equipment and items oh. coming from um, outside. Um, we have uh, poor air systems. So we could have problems with um, HEPA filtration with uh -huh. um, the integrity of those filters and so on. Um, we also have uh, water and water is potentially quite challenging because it's not only a vector for spreading contamination. We have aerosols and or people walking through water, but water also provides a growth source to some types of microorganisms like the Uh, pseudomonad type organisms. But the um, number one contamination source is people. Mm -hmm. And there have been um, different surveys over the years. And these have shown that about two thirds of the contamination comes from people, either people touching things or where people are not gowned correctly. Yeah. It might be like poor mask control, for example. But the fundamental reason is going to be with people shedding um, skin matter. And um, a proportion of that skin matter will be like little rafts carrying microorganisms. Um, so these are the microbial carrying particles that can be dispersed within the clean room environment. So. They're, they're, they're the main sources of contamination. Okay, and how can we avoid this, this kind of contamination in our clean rooms? Um, so just um, working through those ends. So with the transfer of items, um, it is very important that things coming from outside are in lots and lots of different layers of wrapping. And that when things get presented to a, uh, initially a, controlled but not classified area that if they're slightly wet they're allowed to dry and then wrapping is removed and then through each different grade of clean room uh, yes. another layer of wrapping is removed and disinfection takes place and then if it's with um, aseptic processing we're going into the aseptic core then again you have the layer removal ideally passing items through a transfer hatch where there is um, um, unidirectional airflow going over it or a decontamination chamber and we're using a sporocidal disinfectant at that step. Um, with the clean room air um, then we need to make sure that we are testing our um, HEPA filters regularly yeah. Uh, checking for leaks or damage to the filter media. Um, with um, water, then uh, the use of water should be confined to wash bays and there should be clear segregation between wash bays and other clean rooms. And if there are ever any leaks, then we need to um, address those leaks through um, drying and, and disinfection. And then with people, it's about wearing the right types of gowns, training people yes. to get gowned correctly, teaching them things about good mask control, lots of hand sanitization, um, how long a suit can be worn for, and then all of about all the correct procedures about walking mm -hmm. slowly and carefully in clean rooms. Um, it's been shown that the faster somebody walks, the more particles they produce. So it's about 
discipline and good control around around people as well is very important. Yes, training and also uh, clean rooms qualification. It's also uh, a great control, right? Very much so. Yes, and uh, and uh, doing lots and lots of training, particularly for a, a new person. Um, they should do lots of practicing about how to unwrap gowns, how the not to get the trousers onto the floor, yeah. and how to do their hands properly. All of those good things should be should be captured. Okay. Uh, Tim, another question, how to establish uh, alert and action limits in microbiological uh, specification? Okay, um, so with um, for um, sterile manufacturing, then there is some regulatory guidance that can be called upon for action levels, but the alert level needs to be set. And for non-sterile manufacturing, we need to set both the um, alert and action level. Um, the, the, the issue is, is to have a look at um, a, a set of data. So mm -hmm. we need um, uh, a few hundred items of data for each sample type, or we need a period of time of several, several months. Yes. And the thing about microbiological data is that it's um, rarely, it's not often like normal distribution. So standard um, calculations are not easy to do, but there are a number of different tools to use. Probably the most simple one is to yeah. calculate percentiles. So here the data can be put into something like Microsoft Excel or another spreadsheet. And there's a function in there where we could say, take the 90th percentile and use that mm -hmm. as the as the alert level. Um, the other important thing is to review the alert and action levels um, around once a year. And if we have very different processes um, to have maybe different levels for different rooms or group different rooms together as well. Um, so I think it's all about regular review. Are these working? Because the idea of the alert level is to give you an early signal that something might be going wrong. Um, but although learn action levels are important, trending is probably the most mm -hmm. important thing. Um, you need, we need to make graphs of our data and, and, and to look for when things are beginning to go upwards and, and that sort of thing. Yes, yes, of course, to have a, a, as you say, a trend analysis to take into account annual product review, all the monitoring that you have during the, the year to, to make the difference between out of a specification and out of trends and, and to have a, a, a good report about it. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. And um, what is the, the role or what is the impact currently with the rapid uh, microbiological methods in the industry? Are, are that, there, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah ra rapid microbiological methods uh, have a lot of potential. Um, the industry is still very slow at adopting um, those. Um, probably some of the most exciting ones um, are um, so for incubating plants. Um, mm -hmm. There are technologies that um, use a, a blue laser light and they're looking for to um, what they call excite the colonies. Um, so this allows very early reading. So um, you may be able to see whether a sample is over action in one or two days. So much, much shorter incubation times. Okay. There are also um, now a newer generation of particle counters. And these can not only count the number of particles, but they can indicate whether the particle is biological and hence probably a microorganism or is some other type of matter. So you can then um, get real time data as to how the clean room is performing. Oh. Um, and then there's a few other things. So there's obviously like work being done with um, using things like ATP for swabbing um, to again, give much faster, much faster results. But yeah, there's some of the examples of um, 
some of the technologies that are um, emerging. We can also add um, the monitoring of water systems. Um, so it's possible to assess um, uh, the by burden of the circulating water um, and also with um, to record endotoxin as well. And this, but it's a very slow process to move to rapid um, yeah. methods because um, we do have to accept that the, um, the standard environmental monitoring methods are um, limited in a way, um, they're not very accurate. Yes, yes. And, and finally, Tim, a last advice, a last uh, recommendation that you want to give us uh, about uh, what to care or what to take into account uh, during our microbiological controls? Um, in terms of um, uh, about, about controls, was that? Yes, yes. Uh, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, I think the other thing is to also take note of the physical measurements as well, because if a clean room is correctly designed, then there's a number of parameters that assist with contamination control. So obviously we have the filtered air, but um, that's just going to be putting clean air into the clean room, but the people could be producing contamination. So we want the air to be turbulent um, mm -hmm. so that we have good mixing and the contamination remains in suspension. So we need to know that's behaving properly. But then we also need to make sure that we've got sufficient air changes because that's about the changing of the clean air volume and about then taking contamination out, extracting it from the clean room. And we also want to keep the pressure cascade in place to know that if we move from a clean area to a less clean area, that the, the dirty air is not, not coming in. And we also need to control temperature and humidity because yeah. otherwise the operators will start perspiring and the clean room suit will lose its integrity. So we can use all that physical data to support the standard environmental monitoring as well. So we also then do our particle counting, um, our monitoring of microorganisms in the air through active air samplers. Um, we'd be taking our contact plates and swabs from surfaces and mm -hmm. things like finger plates of operators. So you need to put all of this together yes. and look at the big picture because it's all of that coming together that gives the indication of environmental control. Yes, yes, it is a couple of procedures, not just to, to think that with one control is enough, right? Okay. Yes, it's about big picture and it's also about trending that data yeah. over a long period of time. You don't look at a tiny picture, you look at the big picture. Yes, to have the overall picture. Uh, thank you very much, time for your time. I really appreciate that. This is this information will be well uh, accepted in, in our Latin American auditorium. And I hope to, to see you again in the near future. Thank you very much again. Thank you, very happy to help and happy to do this again. Okay, eh, muchas gracias amigos, espero que esta información les sea de utilidad y nos vemos en nuestra siguiente cápsula de Neuroprácticas de Fabricación.